Our first speaker, our keynote speaker, is Danielle Boyer. So Danielle Boyer is an indigenous uh, Anishinaabe enrolled citizen of the Sioux Tribe, youth robotics inventor. In 2019, she founded youth-led charity, The Steam Connection, committed to dem democratizing technical education through personal robots, meticulously, well, sorry, <laughs> meticulously designed, manufactured, and distributed at no cost to youth. Her initiatives have touched the lives of over 800,000 youths with solutions rooted in ro robotics, ethical, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality. Boyer has been named an MIT Solve Fellow, a L'Oreal Paris Woman of, the, of Worth, a People Magazine's Girl Changing the World, and a Verizon Forward for Good winner. She's a two-time guest of the White House, and she is featured. She has a featured story in the Big Idea. Sorry, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> the Big Idea by MIT Solve and HP, a docu series that is an official selection of the Tribeca X Awards, and was selected for Sundance Storytelling. Indigenous Robotics followed her life for a year and will be shown at uh, South by Southwest 2024. So welcome, Danielle. I love how we are all matching right now. Look at this. It was unintentional, I'm just but. Saying, Big Bud Press, sponsor us. <laughs> These are the most comfortable jumpsuits in the world, so if you're ever looking for like a good ethical company, I am obsessed with Big Bud Press. A as you said, we're like, we should be sponsored. But anyways, Buju, hello, my name is Danielle Boyer. Um, I'm a youth robotics designer. I'm 23 years old, and I'm the founder of the technical educational charity, The Steam Connection. And today, I'm gonna share with you my five-year journey as a youth robotics designer uh, to improve educational conditions for my indigenous community. So my people are called the Nishinaabe, which directly translates to the people. Our people are split up into tribes and nations, um, which have their own like governments, uh, policing systems, schools, and more. A lot of people don't know this. Um, my tribe is a Sault Ste. Marie tribe based in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So that's where I grew up, was Michigan in the Upper Peninsula, and um, a little bit in Troy, Michigan as well and I'm what people call an enrolled citizen. And um, our people are very resilient and have faced continued oppression and genocide. And we currently face issues in our community like inaccess to clean drinking water, uh, food deserts, um, language and cultural loss, things like uh, forced sterilization, and also the highest rates of um, murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. And I bring that up because um, this is the month of May that we celebrate and honor our missing relatives. Um, May 5th specifically is the day that we honor all of our relatives that have passed on, um, especially our missing and murdered indigenous women. And I just wanna shout that out. It's a very um, kind of dark opening to the talk, but I always want to acknowledge that, especially because it's coming up soon. And I think that it's important that we're aware. Um, these issues um, are very prevalent also in Canada and the United States. And our parents, as Indigenous people, our parents and grandparents, grew up going to residential schools. And the treatment of our relatives actually inspired the Holocaust. A lot of people don't know this. Um, the schools were designed to forcibly remove our culture and our identity, but today we still stand strong. Um, many of us live on the lands of our tribes, which are called reservations. Um, we were forced to live there, and they tend to be kind of the worst land to live on geographically. The government was kind of like, hey, uh, this is the worst spot here. You're going you're gonna to live here now. And um, the government doesn't give us a lot of support, both in Canada and the United States. It doesn't give us a lot of support, and instead tries to take our land and our resources, even presently. Um, I think it's important to talk about these issues because they are very much in the present and are often overlooked or not well known. And so um, by sharing that story, I hope all of you learn some things today. Um, for me, I carry my people and my culture with me wherever I go, no matter how far. Um, I believe that nothing is more important than ensuring that my people survive and thrive. And that's why I'm speaking with you all today, because I'm using personal robotics uh, to do this. 
um, for and with my people and hundreds of other tribes within the US and Canada, as well as even as far down as Mexico. I am very proud to be here today because um, the Open Source Hardware Association has been amazing. The diversity that they foster, the way that they have included indigenous voices has been such an honor and that's why I'm here today. I think that um, the work that they are doing for the community, especially for makers, is just so exciting. It makes me so happy. So I'm gonna show you, oh, there's a picture of me and my students, but I'm gonna show you a picture of little me. So I'm the one in the furry bucket hat. I'd like to think my fashion has improved since then, but I don't know. So I got started in the world of education when I was 10 years old. And so I'm 23 now, so that's been, that's been a large chunk of my life. But I got interested in education and STEM because of my little sister, Brie. Um, she would always beg us to um, learn about robotics and science, and she'd see kids do cool things, uh, build those Lego robotics and stuff, but we grew up under the poverty line and could not afford to learn robotics. We couldn't afford to participate in the local programs. It was just not something that was doable or achievable for us. But I was determined. I was like, oh my goodness, we have to find a way. We have to find a way for my little sister to learn STEM. It's so exciting. It's so interesting. Um, one day I was at Costco and I saw a series of like animal hand puppets on the shelf. And I took my mom aside and I was like, mom, I have an idea. And she was like, oh no, I had a lot of ideas. Um, She's like, what idea do you have? And I said, what if I taught an animal science class? And at that point, I learned a lot of the world around me through oral tradition and stories. So I was like, what if I just tell stories about animals? I read books and stuff to the students. Um, my mom took me aside and she was like, uh, dude. She actually said dude to me. She was like, dude, you are 10 years old. What do you mean? But she took what I said to heart and I ended up teaching my first kindergarten class when I was 10. And it, th they gave me 25 kids. And it was a semester long. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if they were in desperate need of a teacher or what, but I learned a lot of things like don't feed kids sugar um, at the beginning of your class. I, one time I saw those jumbo marshmallows and I was like, guys, I have an idea. <laughs> bad idea, bad idea. But within that, I learned a lot of things. I learned that um, there were a lot of inaccessibility or accessibility gaps within education, but I also learned that there were things that I could do about it and that students were interested and wanted to learn. A lot of it was just about how to access those resources. So a show of hands, did anyone participate in a youth robotics program or like tech educational program in high school or middle school or younger? I see some hands, yes. So if you can't tell from the image, I was a part of FIRST Robotics growing up. Um, it was an interesting journey for me. I, the, my first time in public school, I had never been in public school prior. I was homeschooled for most of my life. And if anyone tells me that they can tell, I will be so pissed. But. <laughs> I, um, I went to public school for the first time and I was so excited to join a robotics team. We had saved up a lot of money. It was hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It was such a long journey for me to be able to get in the door. Um, but when I got there, I was the only girl and I was the only native on the team. And that felt really, really intimidating. Um, I remember just walking in and I was like, oh my gosh, I have all these ideas, I wanna build things, I wanna learn things. And immediately, um, the guys told me that I was not welcome there and that um, I should just quit. Not only did the guys uh, who were my peers told me that, but my coaches said it too. It was a really uh, lonely environment because I kept trying to do things, I kept trying to participate, and every time that I tried to do something, people would tell me, oh, well, we don't really want you here. And I was like, oh, oh, that stings a little bit. But I was like, maybe this is normal. I haven't seen normal society yet because I was homeschooled, so maybe, maybe this is how people are. And um, it increasingly got more hostile to a point that I was being like sexually harassed, harassed online. I even had drones sent to my house um, where people were, the guys on the robotics team were spying through the window and filming me. Um, and as I've traveled since then and worked with a lot of students all over, my, that experience is not um, original. Some of my other students who are young native girls also have had drones sent to their house by boys on the robotics team. I'm like, wow, I hoped I was the only one. But 
that experience was really isolating and really scary because I just wanted to learn about robots. I wanted to participate on the team and I wanted to do fun things and it felt like every time I tried to learn something, I was just met kind of with a wall. I ended up quitting the team and I joined another robotics team in the same district and the same type of thing happened again. It was so uh, bad <laughs> um, and it made me feel like, well, maybe STEM isn't meant for me. I grew up hearing my dad even say, like, women aren't meant to be in STEM. And I remember I would bring electronics projects home and work on little things that I found here and there and have been learning on YouTube. And he'd just be like, girls aren't meant to do that. And hearing that over and over in my head, it did, it got to me a lot, you know. It felt very um, intimidating. And as I worked with students more and more, this isn't I'm not the only one experiencing this. This is many people all over, and maybe some people even in this room. It has been so difficult to even put my voice out there or to, to learn the things that I need to learn because it felt like the system wasn't created for me to belong. Um, now I make robots, I'll jump ahead, and I preface usually my talks with this fun picture. The main reason is because I'm taller than my grandmother, <laughs> and if you can't tell, I'm five feet tall, five one on a good day. But everything that I create, all the robots that I make, all the things that I design, are all not only designed with my family, but for my family. And I'm gonna talk more about the robots in a second, but these are my language revitalization robots, by the way. They help preserve indigenous languages, and they're so cute, they're called Scobots. Um, but everything I do, everything I create is with my family and my community in mind. And it was because of people like my grandma that I made it through those robotics programs and I made it through those really negative experiences. Um, it's kind of funny because I, I'm from Michigan, right? And I live in California now, but I flew through Michigan <laughs> to get here and I had a layover for like one hour and my parents <laughs> sent me a video of them waving to the, to the sky being like, there you are. Um, and they also made the cats wave as well. And my grandma was in on it and it was hilarious. Um, I, I, was, I was crying a little bit in the airport. It was kind of awkward. I hope no one saw me. But it's because of the support system that I had and because of my amazing family, um, especially the women in my life, like my grandmother, like my mother, like my little sister, that I've been able to push through that and ignore things like what my dad said, girls can't do STEM. My grandma was like, oh, don't listen to him. You gotta make stuff. And it's because of hearing that that I kept, I kept going. Um, and because of all of those combined things, the negative experiences and the positive experiences, I founded an organization called the STEAM Connection so that no girl or um, child like me would ever have to experience the same things. Um, and here at the STEAM Connection, we're paving the way for indigenous youths to have self-determination through advanced digital literacy skills rooted in our traditional cultural values. Uh, we were founded in 2019 when I was 18, so this has been my entire adult life. Um, we're a 501c3 charity. Um, we're led entirely by youth and minorities, and um, we're using robots to help teach dig digital literacy skills in a project-based way. Um, also, it's really fun, as we all know. I love building robots, and so there's no better way to teach STEM, in my opinion, than through robotics. Um, our mission is to empower our communities by providing free access to cutting edge technical educational solutions that we entirely in house design, manufacture, and distribute all completely for free. Uh, that's right, like every robot we make, uh, we've sent out over 12,000 of them all for free. And so it's exciting to be able to see the impact on the students and see the way that STEM is, is reaching our communities in a way that has never happened before. Um, I'm so incredibly proud of the work that um, my team and I have been doing to get STEM into kids' hands. Um, a little bit of our numbers. Right now, we're serving over 800,000 youths, which is amazing. Again, our team is all youth. We're all 25 and under. Um, 25 doesn't really feel like a youth, but technically, they tell me that that is. So I'm not there yet. I have a, I have a couple years left in me. Um, we're 100% designed by youth for youth. All of our robots are designed by young people. Um, everything we offer to students is for free. Um, we've sent out over 12,000 free robots, and we have uh, thousands of users on our virtual learning platform. Um, and we're doing it all through personal and hands-on robotics, as you can see in the little picture right there, some cute little cute robots. 
So before I get into the meeting the robots, I'm gonna go into the why I think STEM is important and why it matters to me to serve indigenous communities. So um, my number one why is our students, specifically indigenous students, lack safe and representative learning spaces. Um, a lot of you may not know this, but native high school students are 237% more likely to drop out of school than white students and underperform in math. Um, this isn't just a statistic, this was also me as well. I didn't drop out of high school, but I dropped out of college because of a lack of safe spaces and not really having people on my side. So I always felt like I'd walk into a classroom very alone and not really knowing what I was doing. And I'm not the only one who experiences that. And so it can be kind of a bummer because it's like, um, our students want to learn STEM, they want to learn cool, exciting, amazing, amazing things in engineering and robotics, but Oftentimes, we're met with professors who aren't supportive or understanding, and oftentimes, academia can be really difficult. And that begins younger than just uh, high school or college. Um, another is our students cannot access the resources that do exist. There's a lot of great resources online, as we know. I am constantly stalking Adafruit's like, um, making resources and like following the tutorials with my students. It was because of that that I um, made a I made stuffed animals into the most menacing animatronics projects ever. Um, I, I one time had a class of all boys, and I was like, let's cut things up. So we took out the stuffing of the stuffed animal, we put some servos in it, we attached it to a circuit playground. Um, they made a little conductive project, so when you like tap on the um, tape, it, it moves, and it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying, oh my goodness. But a lot of those resources are online, we have cool tutorials, we have cool things students can make even with resources that they have in their own home, but they can't access it because only 9% of rural native households have personal computers and fewer have internet access. That is not a lot of people. And even for our community members who do live in the city or urban environments, oftentimes can't afford computers either. For example, I work with indigenous students in Los Angeles and the majority of the students that I work with can't afford laptops either. Um, and so that is another way that our students are further isolated and why we need to get STEM and making resources into their hands. Another is that 80% of high schools located on reservations don't offer computer science courses. Um, when all of us were a bit younger, we probably didn't have comp sci courses in our high schools, but nowadays that's becoming more and more of a common thing, as I think is really important. Comp sci skills are so, so necessary and needed. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of our youth are getting left behind because of things like funding and stuff like that. So kind of all combined, it feels very um, intimidating to approach the world of STEM and to say these skills are really important because we can solve problems and we can help our community when we have these skills, but how are we going to get from A to B? How are we going to get there? And so something that um, helps me kind of formulate these problems and these really big challenges in my mind is something that I grew up being taught, which is called the seven generations teachings, which is that everything you do um, no matter what, every little decision is for the benefit and the prosperity of seven, the next seven generations, and it's with the knowledge and wisdom of seven generations past. So everything that I do, everything that I create, every robot that I make is all for the future generations and is for uh, my future ancestors. When you think that way, when you think in, a, in the lens of sustainability, it really helps you make decisions that can impact the community and the world positively, at least hopefully, right? Um, but this is wisdom that I live by, especially when I'm trying to do dumb 23-year-old things, you know, like getting another tattoo or something like that. My, I, my grandma's words echo in my head and it's like, oh, think of the future. And I'm like, no, but the tattoos, I got like circuits right here. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know if I can listen, um, but I want to hear from some of you, not to call on anybody, so I'm hopeful people could raise their hands, but what's one thing that you've learned from your family or ancestors um, that you kind of carry with you every single day? What's one lesson maybe you've heard from your mom or your dad that's kind of like, I carry this with me and I use this as wisdom to help push forward? Would anyone like to share something? It can be silly too. I have my glasses on. Oh, I see a hand. Yes. You can scream it. Um, 
I love that. So whoever you choose to be your family is your family. And I'd love to hear a couple more people. Yeah. Measure twice, cut once. Measure twice, cut once. You know, that I've heard from my mom as well, but I, I'm not going to lie, I don't do that. I'm like, I can eyeball it, right? Sometimes I don't measure, I'm just cut. I'm like, ooh, and then I'm like, oh, I regret that. Um, <laughs> anyways, because of the not measuring twice, I, um, when I first made my very first robot, um, its name is Every Kid Gets a Robot. It's a robot that costs less than $20 and goes to kids for free. Um, it's, a, it's a simple little 3D printed RC car type guy. Um, kids control it through their phones. Um, it's adorable. Uh, I really love it. But the problem is, is that when I first was making it, um, the electronics did not fit into the chassis of the robot. And it was because I didn't measure right and I didn't order the right parts. And so I, I was really, oh my God, I procrastinated. And I had my robots out there um, just on my table. My mom was like, move them, please. I can't take this anymore. And I was like, no, I have to finish this prototype. Um, and I had a class that night with the robot that I was prototyping. And I was like, oh, these electronics don't fit in the chassis. What am I going to do? I'm going to solder the PLA, which Oh, what a horrible idea. I didn't have any files or anything, so I'm like, I'm going to use heat. Um, that, was, that was regrettable. I ruined a soldering iron. My mom was devastated. She's like, you have to move, move your stuff out of the house. And I did. I did move my stuff out of the house, but um, I also learned a valuable lesson, which is have multiple soldering irons. Because <laughs> um, I've done it more than once. But anyways, does anyone else have anything they would like to share of wisdom that they have learned? that they carry with them now. Yes. I love that. Exposure is key. Thank you. And I'm going to have one more person, hopefully. I won't call on anybody because I can't see that far. One other person. Some wisdom that you carry with you. Yes. Learning math. It's true. I was not taught the same. I wish I would have. My mom was not the greatest at math, and so she didn't really teach me, which when you're homeschooled, you need to be taught that by the one person who is supposed to teach you, your mother. Um, so when I got to high school, I was it was a big shock. I'm not going to lie. Um, and so a lot of the math I've been doing uh, as of the past few years has been with a lot of tutors and a lot of help. And I wish I had learned that sooner. And I wish I had had that wisdom because it would have helped me a lot. Had to do a lot of learning. And I saw one other hand back there. Yes, scream it out because you're way up there. You can make different choices. I like that. Um, you need to tell that to my grandmother and my mother about uh, me not finishing college. <laughs> so now from we have the problems, right? And we have the reason of why I think um, there are some tech accessibility gaps um, within education and indigenous communities. But why does it actually matter? Why do I care about it? And I'm going to talk about the good and the bad, because I think digital literacy skills are more than just pursuing STEM careers. And I think we hear that a lot, blah, 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 pursue STEM careers, go work at Raytheon, go work at Lockheed Martin, um, that type of thing, right? Um, it, me being within the STEM space, oh my gosh, I see that everywhere. The, those companies are actually teaching a lot of our youth STEM skills. And that concerns me. But um, there's the good side of digital literacy, right? When we teach uh, digital literacy skills to students, they're able to make things, like all of us in this room. They're able to solve problems. They're able to invent things to create solutions for their communities. One of the things that I've been working on is um, language revitalization. Uh, language revitalization is really important in indigenous communities because we have a lot of language loss. We've lost a lot of our language speakers over COVID. And so there aren't a lot of language resources for a lot of indigenous languages. So I've actually been using robots and ethical AI to work on that. If I had not learned those uh, STEM skills, I would not have been able to create that. And that's the case for a lot of our community members is they have the skills and they have the interest to want to create these solutions, but don't necessarily have the ability to. 
For example, one of my close friends, Bree, she designs affordable hydroponic systems for Navajo Nation, which is a massive food desert. So she completely creates these hydroponic towers herself, manufactures them herself, which is insane, and she distributes them to Navajo Nation completely for free. Um, a lot of those skills that she gained, she had to teach herself. And she didn't have a lot of people along the way to tell her how to do those things. If we had more mentors, if we had more people like all of you in this room to guide us and to show us what you're making, what you're creating, and teaching us, it would change the world. Um, so that's the good side of things. I think that um, within digital literacy, it helps us have self-determination. It helps us be able to say, this is what I want to create, this is how I want to solve problems, this is what I want to do, and actually be able to execute that. Um, a lot of my students are now creating apps and robots and all these things, and it's because they were taught to. It's because they were taught how to leverage their skills and their interests for good. A lot of the students can't just open up a computer and start learning right away. They don't have those resources. And so I think that when we get those resources out there, when we get those computers out there, when we get those robots out there, our students are able to create these solutions to solve, solve for the future. Um, but then there's also the bad side of things. And I'll, some people are going to disagree with me, but in my opinion, um, I think that within a world of weaponized robotics where they put, you know, um, weapons <laughs> on little robots and they have um, unethical AI being used uh, against marginalized communities, we're seeing things like, um, uh, image generation and AI harm indigenous communities, harm BIPOC communities. We're seeing a lot of uh, tech be utilized in really negative and harmful ways. And it can be really scary, especially seeing stuff on Twitter, seeing stuff online, of all of the negative ways that tech is being used, especially against marginalized communities. Um, it is really scary, like one example is OpenAI, which created ChatGBT and created Dolly. They also created um, something called Whisper, which is an app, and it teaches you languages, right? And it, it pulls information from online. But the problem is, is that they didn't really fact check, and they didn't really ask on if these resources that they're pulling from are correct, or if it's at an accurate depiction of the languages. And they ended up using several different indigenous languages, including the Maori language, um, completely inaccurately. So it's teaching indigenous languages, but it's doing it in an incorrect way. Um, things like this can be really scary and really harmful because we're not able to have our own voice heard within these spaces. We're not able to advocate for ourselves within this technology um, because it's being developed completely without us. We also see a lot of like um, chat or ChatGPT and um, kind of depict our communities being in the past as indigenous peoples. We also see a lot of harmful image generation being created of us, sexualizing us, things like that. We're seeing um, AI being used to um, t pick out um, BIPOC names out of resume readers, um, have really poor facial recognition with BIPOC peoples, all these things. There's a lot of negative sides of technology, of AI, all these things. And it can be really scary because how are we able to stand up to these things and speak up against it if we don't understand what's going on and we don't have the ability to um, to have that voice because we don't have the tech skills. I believe that it's important to say, okay, we need some skills in AI, we need some skills in coding, we need some skills in understanding what's going on so that we can say, this is a problem, I don't agree with how this is being used, and this is how I wanna change it. I think that in order for us to advocate for ourselves, we need to have self-determination in technology. We need to be able to say, okay, I understand what's going on, and I do not want you know, this AI surveillance system on my reservation. I do not want these weaponized robotics on the border, things like that. And when we're able to advocate for ourselves, we're able to empower our communities and we're able to change things. And it can start as simple as little robotics and, and making small things to be able to give our youth and our communities enough skills to be able to potentially save our communities and our lives in harmful tech situations. Um, so that for me is kind of a general, very because I could talk about this forever, but a general overview of the good and the bad and why technology, it has many beauties to it. 
a lot of us are creating really cool things. Like I was reading the agenda and I was like, oh my goodness, all of you are creating such cool things. I want to make a robotic butterfly. And was, was that a sex paddle? Oh my goodness, I was like, this is genius. This is such a cool group, this is crazy. Um, but seeing all these cool things that people are creating, we can leverage all of these skills and we can create the coolest things in the world. And so that's why I'm passionate about technology, why I'm passionate about robotics. Um, but there's a lot of gaps. For example, my organization surveyed 50 leaders in tribal communities, and our results revealed that only four possessed a comprehensive grasp of AI risks, and only one was able to leverage it for positive outcomes, and that one person is an AI expert, so I was like, ooh, okay, this is not good. Um, these problems are scary, and they're becoming increasingly more important. When we equip our communities with tech skills, we can change these numbers and we can change how AI is used in our communities. So how does robots tie into this and why robots? One, I like robots. That's like the <laughs> one of the main reasons. I'm obsessed with robots, they're so cool. Um, I believe that robots are a comprehensive and project-based way to teach technical skills from A to B. So basically, it teaches kids how to program things, how to CAD things, how to wire things, how to um, communicate with each other, problem solving, stuff like that, additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing is my favorite. Um, and so combining all of these skills together helps students understand what they want to learn, what they don't want to learn, but then also be able to say, I can build my own projects with this, I can leverage this, these skills, and I can create more things. The first thing that I created and I mentioned earlier is every kid gets a robot. It's the robot that costs less than $20 and goes to kids for free. Very simple robot, very uh, chill little guy. <laughs> um, and we sent, we've sent out over 11,000 of these robots for free to schools to get kids uh, engaged with coding, engaged with using an ESP32, uh, engaged with additive manufacturing, with ethical design because um, all of these are made out of recycled plastic, recycled materials. Um, so getting the students engaged with all those things, especially the basics in like wiring, because a lot of kids in a lot of STEM projects don't have wiring involved with it. Um, we have had such great success with these projects and we've seen over, um, we, we give out technical assessments and we've seen um, an 80% leap in basic technical skills before and after the students utilize and build these robots. So to me, that's good news, that's exciting because this is not that expensive and we're able to get these resources out to the community. We have our teachers trained how to build them, how to disseminate them. It mean it's good news, not only for my community, but for every community. If we can make STEM learning really achievable, really easy for teachers, because the majority of our teachers are not STEM teachers, they don't have STEM backgrounds, they need help with that, we can make it easy and we can make it achievable. And we need people like makers in our communities teaching with their projects and sharing what they have, not only for our youth, but for all of our community members to show what's possible and what we can create, no matter how crazy it is. <laughs> Um, this here is my passion project, and it is the cutest little robot in the world, and it's called the Scobot. Sco is reservation slang for let's go, and it's a language revitalization robot. Basically, it sits on your shoulder, it speaks, and it, um, it senses motion with a little PIR in the middle, but, and it speaks indigenous languages. Um, we created this because, um, for example, my grandmother speaks my language, which is Nishinaabe Moan, but she didn't teach my mother. And that is a huge gap. And she didn't teach because of really difficult circumstances, especially with upbringing. And so we wanted to create something that would help fill in those generational gaps that are often seen in our communities to be able to say, okay, we can advocate for ourselves, we can teach ourselves. And it's meant to uh, kind of be combined with language learning programs that already do exist. I am by no means an advocate for using robots to replace human interaction. I, I don't think that's smart. But, so my own language, Nishinaabe Moan, is considered an endangered language, which is really scary to me to hear those words. I don't, like, I don't like to hear that, you know? Hundreds of indigenous languages are extinct in the United States, and estimates suggest that only 20 indigenous languages will exist in the US uh, by 2050. 2050 is soon, y'all. That is really scary to me. That intimidates me a lot. By the way, this is my grandma and my auntie. They're so cute. Um, 
But it scares me because we need to be able to preserve our culture through our languages. And if we don't have the resources to learn it, if we don't have the ability, if we don't have the money, the funding, the support, a lot is going to be lost. For me, as I'm learning my language, it is sad because there's not a lot of always resources out there, especially in my dialect. And it's important that we do learn and that we do know. Uh, not only so that we know, but that we can teach our values, our stories, and keep that onward for the next seven generations and beyond. So when I was creating my robot, I thought, what could everyday Nishinaabe toys look like in the future? And I came up with the little Scobot. Aren't they precious? They have little hats and regalia and things like that. And I wanted to create something that the students could look at and say, this was created for me. This was created for my community. This was created for my people. I think oftentimes our youth look at STEM projects and they don't necessarily see themselves reflected in it. Even things like my Every Kid Gets a Robot robot, anyone can access that. But I wanted to create something that our youth could look at and say, that was definitely made for me. It's got beadwork on, you know? And so um, the robot speaks four different languages, including my language, Nishinaabe, Moen. And we wanted to create it out of, it's a little 3D printed little guy made out of recycled plastic, uh, some basic electronics, and it's been a huge success. We've sent out um, over a thousand of these robots for free to tribal schools and language programs. And I think it's like, it's wearing a Build-A-Bear tutu, by the way, which is absolutely <laughs> precious. But seeing how we're able to leverage those skills and leverage those um, making abilities, um, the skills in electrical engineering, computer science, all these things, and build it into creating this little robot here that's now serving thousands of students is something that I think is absolutely beautiful. And I want to see more projects like this. I want to see more things being used to uplift and empower our communities and each in our own ways. I think something that excites me uh, about the maker community is the potential to scale. A lot of our projects when we start don't necessarily expand to a larger audience or community, but with the right tools and the right teams, we can get our stuff out there to more people. And I think that's really cool. Now, mass manufacturing these, oh my god, I do not mass manufacture them. As you can probably see looking at them, they are nearly impossible to 3D print. Um, they are very <laughs> curved. Uh, I did that because I was being quirky and different and I thought it would be cute and then I uh, saw how long it took to print them and I was like, oh my goodness, I need to change this design a little bit. Um, but right now each robot is custom designed with each community that we work with. Something that's very important within uh, something called data sovereignty, so the ability for indigenous communities for us to own our own data and information and our own languages is for us to be able to say how things like this are going to be used. Some of the language robots, I will never be able to play the recordings for you because the communities have asked us not to and have asked us not to share those resources with the wider public. Another thing that's really scary is that um, a lot of companies not only have tried to steal our designs, but have also stolen entire indigenous language libraries and resource resources. There's this organization um, that was uh, claimed to be serving Lakota, the Lakota community, and um, they created language resources with the community. They um, created textbooks and had elder recordings and all these things. And then after they created it, they attempted to sell it back to the Lakotas. Um, which is not ethical by any means, but they were like, we have the copyright on it. So it's important for us to be able to create resources like this and for it to be by us, for us, owned by us. Um, and that's a huge problem that we face in many different ways, not only just with our languages or things that we invent or things that we create, but can be in many different directions and in many different ways. Um, and that can be really scary. So. I believe that when we ensure that our youth get educated in these resources and get educated within STEM, we have a, a better chance of advocating for ourselves within these spaces. Also, as I said, the robots wear regalia. So I'm wearing a, a jingle chain right now. If you can see, I'll see if everyone can see me. A jingle chain right now, um, which is something that we wear 
kind of our traditional style dress, specifically uh, Nishinaabe style. Uh, we call it jingle dress dancing, and um, it's something that we do a lot at like powwows and things like that. And um, not only do I wear a cool jingle chain often with me, but I also, my robot, which was inspired by Hello Kitty, this one, um, it wears a jingle chain as well, so that when students see it, they can say, oh my goodness, I can see myself within that. I can see my own community, my own culture represented in these ways. Um, that's, that's exciting to me. And um, something else that really excited me was the fact that the little robots have kind of little minion type faces, which was unintentional. But oh my goodness, people are like, never make a yellow one. And I was like, ooh, I made one for UCLA. <laughs> and it was, their colors are yellow and blue. It looked like a minion, oh my goodness. Not on purpose, not on purpose. But um, one of the main things that I did to design the robot in this way was I based it around Cynthia Brazil's research. Um, she's a, a lead at uh, the MIT Media Lab. Um, she's a personal robotics expert. And I suggest looking into her work, by the way, because she makes the most demented robots you will ever see the most terrifying robots, you have to look. Uh, she made a cute one named Jibo, but she also made a terrifying one with human fingers on what looks like a Furby. So you, ha you have to look. But her research says, oh, if a robot has a face, students can respond to it, and it can help prevent developmental delays. Um, I was like, this isn't too much of a face, but let's see. I ended up bringing my robots to a powwow for the first launch that we ever did a few years ago. And we had babies looking up at the robot. And we had kids coming up and interacting with it and dancing with the robot. They're like, can I play Spider-Man music? And I'm like, not yet, but that's a good idea. <laughs> um, and so being able to see how that research was able to interact with these kind of robot applications has been really exciting. The students feel so passionate about it, and it's like their little class pets, which is so cute. These are some of the student-decorated robots. Um, you can see one of them has abs on the far left. Um, the second is a bodyguard. The third is a powwow princess named Bougie Bertha, I think. Um, the fourth one is a, uh, a powwow dancer, jingle dress, you can see the jingles, um, jingle dress dancer, who is a COVID advocate and has, a, a, what is it, Purell on it? I, and then um, the last one has muscle arms. And the students decorated these and it's absolutely adorable to see how they're kind of adopting these little creatures. And they, by the way, are wearable with a GoPro strap, which I think is more engaging and exciting for the kids it feels less like they're, there's just robots and more like they're a part, the robots are a part of the conversation, the dialogue, things like that. Uh, here's another student decorated robot with some of my NAWA students from Los Angeles. This is the only tribal school in Los Angeles. These students are so smart, y'all. Oh my gosh, they're way younger than me and they're developing like AI projects. And I'm like, oh my goodness. This is crazy. Um, Leela, by the way, on the far right, she just got into like Stanford, Caltech. Um, I think she got into MIT. She got into pretty much everywhere she applied. And I'm so incredibly proud of her. She's going to be pursuing engineering. And so that, oh my goodness, that makes me so excited. This here is a little resin scobot where you can see some of the prototyped electronics on the inside. Also, how, many, how long do I have left? I don't know if, I don't know. 10 minutes, OK. That's good to know. I, when I looked at the agenda, I looked at when I had to be here, and I failed to look at when I had to end. So I do that a lot. Sometimes I'll just keep talking, and people will be like, hey. I'm like, oh, I didn't talk long enough. And they're like, no, actually, you went over. And I'm like, I went over? Oh, my goodness. Everything goes uphill from here, from my first talk I ever gave, which was for FIRST Robotics, and it was two hours long. No one, should, unless it's a workshop, should ever have to listen to me talk for two hours. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, it was, oh, someone fell asleep too? What, once, once someone falls asleep during your first talk you ever give when you're like 16, you're ready for anything. You can handle, you can handle anything, oh my goodness. I, I've had my fair share of embarrassing moments as well while speaking. For example, I was giving a talk in Edinburgh last month and to a, a group of academics. And you see the picture on the far right? I looked at it, and I, I just suddenly said in front of an entire group of very professional, stoic academics, I was like, nips out, am I right? <laughs> no, I did not. Oh my gosh, that was terrifying. Oh, everyone was stone-faced. Only one person laughed. And it was someone who had 
who was already like knew about my work and had been messaging me for months on Instagram. So he laughed out of pity. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, wow. So everything goes up from there, you know? Oh. So <laughs> the Scobot was inspired by Talking Elmo. Um, my mentors and I were like, if Talking Elmo can talk, we can make a robot that speaks indigenous languages. I don't know how exactly it got from A to B, but it might or might not have been inspired by Michael Reeves. And if you know anything about that project, I won't name that project, but that is <laughs> what kind of inspired the creation of the Scobot. And on the right is the first sketch we ever created of what we wanted the Scobot to look like. We created it hands-on with our students, and we were like, okay, we want a little droid, we want cat ears, because I am obsessed with my cats, Yo-Yo, Yoda, and Rex. They are, they're big guys, and so we were like, we need cat ears, we need little feet, we need to sit there, and we just want to be cute, we want to be engaging for the kids, we want to be exciting. And we didn't want it to be something that was uh, stereotypical or something that uh, the students just couldn't relate to. So we made it with them, and now when they look at it, they're like, oh my gosh, I want to keep it. And I'm like, don't you dare steal it. Don't you dare steal it, because oh my goodness, I've had, I've had the desire to steal other people's robots, so I understand, you know? Do you ever see those delivery robots, and you're like, what if I took one? And they've got some cute ones I've seen in Canada with little faces, and I was like, Oh, if anyone afterward wants to meet up and help me do something, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, this is part of the manufacturing process. Um, so our Every Kid Gets a Robot robots, um, the little kits, are. we have a lovely team working on those now. Um, but these guys, I make most of them myself out of a storage unit in San Diego. Um, it's a five by 10. <laughs> uh, and so I create all of those things. I uh, 3D print a lot of them on my many Prusas I have, yay. And um, I, oh, I can't run my printer at night because my neighbor, it upsets him. Ah, oh, how, and so all my prints now have a line in them. That's so, oh, it makes me so mad, but he'll, um, he'll bang on the ceiling if I print too late. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, man, I'm so sorry. So I need to build a little like soundproofing thing for this, but that's what the manufacturing process looks like. I do not have that long left because I could chat about robots and all those things forever. But um, yeah, I hope y'all enjoy learning more about the language revitalization robots and some of my context behind it. I know it's a lot of information as low-key an info dump, um, but I wanted to kind of tell you why this project matters to me, why making matters to me, why STEM matters to me, and why I think what all of you are doing uh, in our community is important and it's exciting. And I would love to learn more about all of your projects and cool things that you are creating. If you want to reach out, I reply in three to five business months. Um, <laughs> So uh, I, I'm best reached at Instagram in the DMs. I will actually reply to those sometimes. Unless it's menacing. Do not send me anything menacing, please. I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. Um, so yeah, you can find me on Instagram where I post a lot of robot stuff, on TikTok where I post a lot of robot stuff. Sometimes I review things like 3D prints and create menacing content. So if that interests anyone, feel free. Um, also, if you have any educational requests or you want to learn how to integrate uh, the robots that I have into your community or things like that, especially the little ones, feel free to email me. Again, it might take a hot second. I also have application forms open to everyone on my website where you can apply to bring the little robots to your own community and bring them to your classroom and everything completely for free. So feel free to apply for that. Again, it'll be three to five business months. But anyways, um, miigwech, thank you, and yeah. <laughs>